Thank you so much. Um, let me just double click the iPad so we're on a. Um, when, I, when Seth talked about it, having an intergenerational conf uh, conversation, it always makes me feel a little bit old. Because I always sort of still think of myself as like vaguely postgraduate and like still in, but you know, the, 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 the facts suggest otherwise. And so I believe you have to go with the facts. Uh, I am not going to introduce our guest uh, because if you do not know who Bill Gates is, then you have been living on Mars for the last 50 years. Um, but what I will do is a ask you, Bill, to, to tell us why you got so interested in public health in the first place. There were many things you could have done um, with your money and more importantly with your time. What got you interested in this? Well, during uh, the time at Microsoft, I was pretty monomaniacal. You know, I wasn't looking at what it was like in poor countries. I didn't think about infectious disease. Uh, but the success of Microsoft was so phenomenal uh, that I was starting to think about, okay, how would I give the money back? You know, where would there be high impact? And I thought, well, probably philanthropists have picked all the really good stuff. You know, there might not be anything that's super dramatic. Uh, but, you know, looking at the general human condition, you know, I looked at, okay, childhood deaths as part of that. I looked at um, malnutrition and more people growing up with their full physical and mental capabilities. And I was pretty stunned, um, a World Development Report written by a team managed by Larry Summers in 1993 uh, caught my eye. And it explained how we don't treat lives as very valuable, and yet if you improve health in poor countries, that lifts them up uh, by having parents think that maybe they don't need to have as many children to have a at least two that survive and support them into old age. And so uh, with Melinda, we picked global health as our big thing. Um, I have to say, the more we got into it, the more we realized how underfunded things like malaria and HIV and tuberculosis were. Uh, and so that's become the vast majority of what the foundation does. Because of that, you know, we've had to learn a lot of vac about vaccines, about uh, different respiratory diseases, including the flu. And that whole community, which isn't a gigantic community, you know, is always talking about when might the next big one come. Uh, you know, we had some flu deaths in 56 and 67, but really it's that 1918 Spanish flu that gets death levels above World War I death levels right, right. for the two years that it's there. It's, you know, you think, well, hey, did the... Some people must look at that and think, did the war last you know, to 1919? No, the Spanish flu uh, came along and killed more people uh, per year uh, than the war did. And so you're always talking about our, what would we do? How bad would it be? And it's scary because the amount of travel now is so great that the speed, that one they were, it was unlucky because the demobilization helped spread the disease. But, now we have way more international travel uh, than ever in the past. I, I want to pick up on one thing <clears throat> you talked about when, when you were talking about starting the foundation and fo fo picking its focus, which I was always struck by as somebody who grew up in India, which is you made a very conscious decision, it seemed to me, to treat all human life as equally valuable, which is very, very unusual. I mean, when you look at the charitable giving around the world, there is almost all of it assumes, you know, that spending much, you know, on an American life or on a British life or, you know, Indian life is much more that. And you really adopted this global view that, that you were going to try and do the most good with the money. And the most good was defined by saving people's lives or extending their quality of life, no matter where they were born, no matter what their passport. Um, did that just strike you as the rational thing to do? Did you realize that it was pretty unusual? Well, Warren Buffett has this way of uh, expressing that, which is, you know, the genetic lottery, uh, the birth lottery. You know, what if you didn't know what country you would be born in, what sex you were going to be? You know, how would you want the world to be improved so that as you enter that world, your chance of a reasonable life are, are somewhat better? And so, 
um, you know, we did say we were going to put about 20% against causes in the United States. And we've mostly done education, scholarships, some things in libraries. You know, so we let 80% go to the highest impact per dollar and 20% go to the country that had helped create both the Microsoft fortune and then later Warren Buffett joins in. So now about half the resources actually are from his unbelievable uh, commitment to the foundation. It, it, it's absolutely true that philanthropic dollars spent at all reasonably will have over 10 times the impact in a country with very limited resources than in rich countries. Now, whether philanthropists choose to follow that or not, you know, that's completely up to them. I would say most people who travel and see it firsthand, they're like, oh gosh, I have to get uh, in on this. And, uh, but if you don't travel there, you, it's a little abstract. Because yeah, yeah. uh, when you travel, what you notice is they're the same people. Yeah, that, the, the com commonality of humanity. Um, tell us about um, predicting this pandemic. Um, you very famously gave a speech at a what is normally a kind of security conference, a national security conference in Munich. And you said, you're spending all this money on defense budgets, but <laughs> here's the thing that's going to kill more people than a war. Um, why, why were you so calm? You know, it could have, if 15 years have gone by and nothing had happened, you might, you might have looked foolish. Why, why were you so confident? Well, I wasn't confident, but I was willing to take a risk and go out on a limb because, you know, the modern world is just so susceptible to this human-to-human -human transmissible respiratory virus. And the boundary between us and nature, you know, we're invading more area, you know, we're getting into, you know, where bats are having, getting squeezed and uh, many diseases have come. HIV came through chimpanzees, Ebola uh, came from bats. And yet I saw that the amount required to get ready would be actually pretty modest. Now, sadly, I didn't make the sale. There were a few things done, like a vaccine group called CEPI was organized, and um, Welcome Trust, our foundation in three countries, helped fund that. But overall, it sort of fell on deaf ears. So 90% of the viewing of the Munich security speech or the TED speech, which were really both in 2015 on that topic, uh, didn't get much resonance. I did think a security event was a good place to talk about that because there's a form of pandemic that is intentionally caused, bioterrorism. And what you need to do to protect yourself from that is a superset. It's even more demanding than being ready for a, a natural infection. And so, hey, military budgets are big. I thought, you know, let's, yeah. let's yeah. get some of that money against this cause. But at least at the time, it, it was not successful. So you did convince one person, which was me, because I did a, a, a thing on my show about it. And you know, sometimes these segments go viral. This definitely did not. Um, and it got me thinking, you know, again, when the pandemic happened. So it, part of me thought, well, it's because it's a very small chance of a very big disaster. On the other hand, we spend a lot of money on wars, which have very small chance of very big disasters. You'd spend money to prevent it, uh, or uh, even something like an earthquake. What is it about this? Do, do you think this, this one is particular, you know, peculiar, or is it just that normal human reaction of, why do I have to spend something today that may or may not happen 20 years from now? Well, infectious disease is such a good story in rich countries that it, the burden of infectious disease is very, very modest. And you know, nobody dies of measles, uh, diarrhea, pneumonia, you know, the big killers that plus malaria of kids in poor countries just aren't, aren't that dramatic. The other thing about pandemics is they don't come along very often, at least with fires or combat or earthquakes. You have small ones that kind of remind you, okay, there could be a big one uh, someday. And so that kind of gets you on alert. I was stunned when I looked into uh, being ready for fires 
that the U.S. alone has 300,000 fi full-time firemen. I mean, wow, that's great. And of course, they do a little bit more than fire, but that yeah. they, it, it, it's been easier for me, I think, to explain what we need to do for pandemics using that fire analogy because the public sees the fire hydrants and they see the fire station and they're kind of trained about you know those exits and be calm uh, if we need to evacuate for fire. The war games and the war practice that goes on, it's super professional, but people just, it's too abstract right, right. for them to appreciate that without practice, you're never going to be able to figure out what to do uh, when time is of the essence. And infections are exponential. You know, if you catch it in the first 100 days, it's less than 2% of the deaths. If you let it linger for two years, you know, here we are globally a, a bit over 20 million, it looks like. So just to give people a sense, what you're saying is we had caught this one in the first 100 days, which was definitely doable, something on the range of 9.8 million lives in the United States would be saved. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the U.S. itself, uh, you know, is right around a million. Uh, Sorry, nine, 980,000 exactly, lives would exactly. be saved. Exactly. Uh, and... You know, Australia almost got it right. You know, they're down at 10% of the deaths, you know, per capita of the United States. And they had practiced a little bit with the previous, uh, the SARS-CoV-1 uh, had made them think, gosh, our public labs can't do diagnostics. We have to team up with these commercial PCR machine people. And that's how we'll be able to find the cases and isolate them and avoid that big slope right, right. and because once you get on that slope also it's important that the only way to deal with it is then lockdowns which are also economically very expensive right so it's really there's a huge ad advantage to being able to get it before that exponential slope goes yeah up. there's only one country that got past one percent infection and then got it to zero which is south korea used an extreme form of contact tracing yeah. where yeah. without even asking your permission they would look but the, using the cell tower data and see where you'd been. And they were pretty ruthless about how they enforced right, their right. contact tracing. Everyone else that's a super outlier pretty much reacted quickly. Taiwan, New Zealand, right, right. Uh, Singapore. Um, and, you know, and then they got their vaccination levels up so that eventually they didn't have to be extreme about uh, blocking people coming into the country. So where are we in this, in terms of this pandemic? How would you describe it? Uh, yeah, that's tricky because our understanding of what variants are gonna come is very limited. We did not expect anything like this Omicron variant that is so transmissive. In fact, scientists are thrilled still trying to figure out where the heck did it come from because it's only related all the way back to the original virus. And so there's reasons to think it may have been in another species and crossed back over, but that seems strange. You know, if there was a group of humans it was growing in, why didn't, it, why didn't we see it sooner? Anyway, our, uh, the science in this area will get a lot of attention, I hope, in the next decade. There could be more variants come that would be uh, immune escaping because their shape of their spike protein would be a little different. And sadly, they could even have a higher fatality rate. You know, I rate the chance of that as, you know, maybe five to 10%. Uh, but, you know, if you tell people that risk isn't there, then the whole idea of, okay, you know, throw your masks away, don't get your boosters, you're going to put people incredibly at risk. For now, we need to keep boosting, uh, particularly the elderly. And even though we'll have a lot of cases, we don't have to use masks. Um, you know, the public should be ready and not view it as a deep infringement of, you know, their freedom that when you get local outbreaks, which, you know, in the fall we'll have some of that, it helps a lot to, to have very high vaccination levels and in certain settings, mask wearing. So let's talk about that issue of the public accepting some restrictions on their, on their movement. 
Um, you and I have talked about you know, Taiwan, which is this extraordinary case. I mean, 22 million people, I, the, I don't remember the latest death numbers, but it's sort of under 1,000. And to, but just by comparison, New York State is 19 million. I think we're up to 40,000 deaths or something like that. So it gives you a feel for how well Taiwan did. And they did it because they didn't do lockdowns. They instead said, if you have uh, COVID or if, you, they, if you've been in contact with somebody, you have to quarantine. Um, it was a 14-day mandatory quarantine where they give you a, cell, a government-issued cell phone and they checked on you three or four times a day to make sure that you were adhering to it. But by doing that, they kept 1% of their population in quarantine, at, you know, if you add up all the numbers of people. But 99% were able to live their lives with no lockdowns, no restrictions of any meaningful kind other than mask wearing. Is that, I mean, do you think we could in America um, accept that kind of trade-off? It seems logically, you know, to make a lot of sense. You, you, one one percent of the people suffer 14 days of restrictions on their liberty, but the result is the other 99% live mostly free. If if all we would have had to do was say a 45-day lockdown, I think we would have gotten pretty good compliance. It says the lockdown starts extending out, uh, and you know the lockdown hasn't dropped the cases to zero. You know, so the counterfactual of okay, how much worse would it have been if we hadn't had this lockdown is unclear. There was a lot of uncertainty about, for example, school shutdowns. Right. Uh, to this day. You know, there's still arguments about uh, how many cases that avoided. It's pretty clear because young people uh, don't get sick from the disease very often uh, that we probably, if we knew everything we know today, we would have shut schools down a lot less than we did during right. this pandemic. I mean, yes, it's tricky for the elder adults. It's tricky uh, in a lot of ways. And you mean by that high school and under? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, for college, going virtual tends to work awfully well. The infection levels are a little higher as you get up into that age group. But K through 12, we have a learning deficit that will take us a long time to erase that. And sadly, it's a deficit where the inner city is where it's almost two years, suburban schools less, private schools in some cases. Uh, like my kids, almost no deficit at all. But back to this, should we be willing to accept some restrictions on our liberty? Ab absolutely. But, you know, the U.S., that's not our greatest strength. That is making, uh, in some cases, sacrifice for the collective. Now, during the war, uh, we might see that. Certainly, if you go all the way back to World War II, there was incredible sacrifice for the collective goal. The country really did come together around that. Um, since then, well, you know, after 9-11, to the degree there was anything people could do, you felt that spirit of, okay, what do I have to do uh, uh, to help the people who suffered or to go, you know, make the people who caused the problem pay a price for that. Uh, but we're, not, we're, we're a society of individual rights, and there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, so we're not optimized for pandemics. Um, you know, Japan and South Korea, even though they didn't catch things early, they have a, their reaction to mask wearing is very different. Right. It's a, even in typical flu season, you get massive mask wearing, particularly on the subway or any time you're forced to be close together. So the, their mask wearing is partly why those are also two incredible positive outliers. Um, and when you think about, um, what the next pandemic would look like. Um, you have in the book a, a kind of fantasy or, or a proposal or a dream of what. Describe for us, pandemic breaks out probably in some uh, Asian country, reports of infectious disease, respiratory virus. What should happen? Yeah, so the key is that we don't use the word pandemic until it kind of goes global. and. So the idea is that you see these outbreaks that are in just one country or a few, and you take whatever the resources are in those countries or global resources, and you get them in there to do this 
high scale diagnosis and quarantine people who are infectious. Um, you know, you try and make sure that people aren't carrying the disease into lots of countries. So you have to test people if they want to go out. You may even test them as they're coming into uninfected countries. And if, so if you do that quickly enough, you never have to use the word pandemic. Um, the fact that sequencing is getting cheap enough, it, it means that as soon as you see an unusual uh, increase in respiratory sickness or death, you very quickly look at it and say, oh, is this some virus we've never seen before? Is it a form of flu? Is it a form of coronavirus? And then you quickly uh, get working on therapeutics and vaccines. We are likely to have some drugs that just independent of the virus put your immune system on alert. So we could reduce the amount of infection by 95% just with a general uh, pill that we could stockpile and during that first 90 days slow the disease down in that whatever area it's in. Uh, that would have to be a global resource. You know, countries would have to admit, hey, we're seeing these deaths. And there's always a, a bit of a disincentive, to be honest, because it shuts, it, it could cause panic. You have to worry about that. It would shut down some commerce, particularly including tourism. Right. And, you know, so we saw, you know, we'll be debating till the end of time, you know, could China have notified people two weeks earlier, three weeks earlier? Um, you know, we did have the sequence uh, by mid-January, and that was sort of the starting line where vaccines got made within a year. But what about that issue? Because it is so much in the public eye and people have heard about it, where people say not only China, you know, hid, were delayed telling people, uh, but then was highly uncooperative in terms of any investigation that was trying to look into what happened, told the WHO they wouldn't allow the inspectors unfettered access, and that a lot of people say, and you know, because your proposal depends on a lot of global cooperation, a lot of people would say China demonstrates that this is never going to work because the, you know, here you have a big powerful government that just refused to cooperate. Well, they could have cooperated more than they did. Uh, you know, there's a tax against them, you know, like was it from the lab or was it intentional that go way too far. And they have released a fair bit of data and the case that it was in this wet market where you buy uh, live animals of various types. I think the case for that is very, very strong. Um, you know, the other case besides somebody like China who has sort of defending their interests is that it breaks out in a very poor country where even without a, a plot, you know, you don't see it very well. So we do need a system that even if it d gets into lots of countries, if it hits that pandemic level, we can make therapeutics and vaccines very quickly. I'm hopeful uh, that we've all learned our lesson, and so if it breaks out in China again, that they would be more forthcoming next time. It didn't benefit them, right. uh, and you know, th sadly, enough people had left China by then that, and you know, other countries weren't stepping up to do that diagnosis. Uh, you know, we were in for a global thing. It wasn't until early February when I was in a meeting that experts at the foundation said, there's no way, you know, this, there's been too much uh, travel without diagnosis uh, for us to contain this. And then at that point, we didn't really understand the fatality rate. You know, we didn't understand that it's a fairly low fatality rate and that it's a disease mainly of the elderly kind of like flu is, although a bit different than that. So that was a pretty scary period right. uh, where the world didn't go on alert, including the United States, nearly as fast as it needed to. And it's important, I, I think, to, to point out, that's just the particular characteristic of this virus. It's not inherent. You could have a zoonotic, that is a, a, a virus that jumps from an animal to humans that attacks young people, that attacks everyone, that is very lethal. I mean, you know, something like AIDS, for example, these are all zoonotic diseases. We, in some ways we got unlucky if you're older, but in some ways we got lucky that, for example, people under 18 really don't get it much. 
Yeah, smallpox, which is the only disease we've ever eradicated, had about a 30% death rate. Wow. And so, you know, that's a factor of 100 worse. You know, bubonic plague had a death rate of about 40%. So awful pathogens uh, can show up. Even in the case of flu, there have been some variants that are even more fatal than the Spanish flu was. The good news is that we've never seen since 1918 something that combined an ability to transmit very effectively and this very high fatality rate. I mean, HIV is kind of a weird one because that's not respiratory, it's right, sexually right. transmitted. It's amazing given that, that it, it's gotten as big, it's, you know, that by every definition is a pandemic. It's this weird thing where it, it, you live with it and you're transmitting it uh, for quite a number of years, seven or eight years, before you are visibly symptomatic. Now the test could tell, but that long period before you have symptoms, the latency period, was so long that it, it starts out in the 1950s and the world doesn't even realize what's right, going on right. until the 80s. And then by the 90s, we have therapeutics, uh, but we don't even have a vaccine. So the, it's, it would be easy to overfocus on, okay, if coronavirus happens again, let's be ready for that. I do think it'll be a respirator respiratory spread. Um, and so that helps a bit in terms of, okay, masks or things that you inhale that block infection. Uh, those types of innovations are worth, worth inventing. So the one big difference between this pandemic and every previous one was the arrival of the vaccines. And the vaccines on an amazingly accelerated time scale. I mean, the last vaccine, I think you have this in the book, it, it took about four or five years. This one really took four or five months, if you think about it, by the time they had got it right, and then they were doing testing to make sure uh, it, was, it was okay. Do you think that particularly because of this new mRNA technology, um, that one, that's one thing we can be confident of, that going forward, you know, no matter what the virus, we will be able to, within nine months, have a vaccine? Probably. Um, you know, there, the HIV, has a way of evading the immune system that we've never seen in any respiratory virus. Um, so saying that that can't be done, but it's very unlikely. Every respiratory virus has some protein that latches onto cells in the lungs and that enters. So ACE2 in the case of uh, uh, COVID is the way it gets in. And what we can do is we can make a vaccine that alerts the immune system, okay, that shape, attack that shape when you see that. And mRNA, uh, you know, we could even speed it up a bit faster. There had never been a commercial product using mRNA. And so it's wild that it was so fast. Even the non-mRNA vaccines worked very well. Probably the two best are the Pfizer and Moderna that are both mRNA, but even the AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, there's a lot of good vaccines. The vaccines are imperfect in, in two very important ways. One is they don't block infection. We were hoping that the vaccine would create enough antibodies in your upper respiratory tract, including your nose and throat, that vaccinated people wouldn't get infected. And part of the impetus to say, okay, even young people who don't get very sick should get vaccinated is if you can take them out of the transmission chains, that drops the numbers very rapidly. Well, once Omicron comes along, the vaccine is not reducing transmission hardly at all, particularly about three or four months after you take the vaccines. We need to fix that. Uh, and there's good ideas about how to do that. The other thing is duration. You know, we're seeing through a variety of the data, uh, Israel data, UK data, that particularly if you're in your 70s, within four or five months of taking the vaccine, the protection really is going down. Weirdly, for young people, uh, that protection does not seem to go down. And, and we've seen this with previous vaccines, like the flu vaccine actually doesn't work that well in the elderly. We're gonna create some new flu vaccines that, that are much better. And so, you know, the RNA vaccines are a miracle, but they weren't perfect. Um, and so next time, I think we'll have much better vaccines and, and better therapeutics as well.
Let's just talk for a moment about the mRNA because it just feels like such a breakthrough technology. So as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, the traditional vaccine, you would take some piece of the virus, uh, usually some very high recognizable piece, and you'd put it into the vaccine and you put it, in, you know, so inject it in the body so that the idea is that your cells look at it and say, oh, that's the thing to protect, you know, to protect me against. And it's not so lethal that you'll get the disease. It's just lethal enough that it triggers your immune system. What the mRNA does is it doesn't need to do that physical thing. It literally sends you a message. It's like an email, or it's actually probably more like a Snapchat message because it disappears after it goes into you saying, hey, this is what you should look for. Could that, I mean, is that transforming? Because I think of, you know, the way you made vaccines in the old days, there's a lot of trial and error, bespoke. You got to sculpt the vaccine exactly right. Did you, did you put too much? Is it a weakened form? Here, it's almost like you just put in a computer, co you know, it's like a, a more mass-produced version of vaccines. Does that mean we can get vaccines for things like cancer, for AIDS, for everything? Uh, not immediately, but the dream is, yes, the, a lot of the funding for these mRNA companies is uh, for cancer-related vaccines. And part of the beauty is that even if the thing you're trying to attack in the cancer, you know, only a small number of people have it, it's so easy to, to change the instructions in the vaccine. You don't have to build a whole new factory and right. verify the factory. You just type those numbers in and hopefully the regulator sees, oh, you're just doing this small thing, go ahead. Particularly for cancer where the outcome, if you don't treat the patient, is very Indeed. poor. It's not healthy people that you're treating. And so when people look at, uh, the three mRNA companies, CureVac, Moderna, BioNTech, that, that can, they each have cancer groups uh, that you know, they're excited about. They can also make uh, medicines that have been expensive, protein medicines like growth factors, and uh, they'll you know, try to do quite a few vaccines. So yes, it's a much easier way of making the vaccine because you tell the body to make the spike protein and then have the immune system recognize it and get ready to attack it as opposed to you actually stick the spike protein in and you have to do it on top of something right. and figuring out what that is, you know, is, is kind of hit or miss. And so the factory for mRNA uh, is pretty generic. You know, what Pfizer, you know, they in a typical year before the pandemic made 200 million vaccines in a year. The COVID vaccine, they made a billion and a half in the first year. Um, and so the scale up of that manufacturing, and as they did that, their cost per unit, right. you know, it starts at like 60 and is probably, they don't like to say, but probably below $5 at this point. And, but uh, one of the other things that made it possible to manufacture this vaccine so quickly all over the world was these extraordinary agreements that companies made where they would say, okay, we came up with the, this vaccine, but we're gonna let another 20 companies or 20 factories around the world do it. I think the analogy you have in the book is, you say, imagine if Ford were to say to Mercedes and Porsche and Toyota, go out and make this, this car of ours and go and sell it, you know? Yeah, so the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is really o Oxford uh, invented and then the pharmaceutical company, they took it up. They went around and because it was a more conventional adenovirus vector vaccine, more conventional, they could go to different vaccine companies around the world and say, we'll help you use your factory. And the biggest volume vaccine manufacturer in the world, not by sales, Pfizer is the biggest by sales because they sell expensive vaccines, but Serum in India, Pune, India, uh, makes over a billion vaccines a year. And so they were able to ramp up their version of the AstraZeneca uh, and make so far 1.4 billion. A lot of those helped in India, uh, some got, got exported out. So there was a level of cooperation in 2020 uh, that got us to the point where now, actually there's too many COVID vaccines. They're spoiling, you know, now that's due to an unfortunate fact that the messaging and logistics 
of getting vaccine take up, particularly in low income countries, has been so limited that the supply side is now not a problem, but these other right. things are. And you know, even the US, you know, we're not at 70% coverage. And even if you look at elderly, which to me is the figure you should pay most attention to, you know, we're only at about 80%. And if you take boosted, we're only at about 50%. And so, China is even lower for elderly. You know, right? China's got a, China has to, while they try and suppress this thing, they have got to vaccinate and they've got to use a vaccine that's even better then. than the two that they've used. They, they, their vaccines are the oldest technique called inactivated, where you literally grow the virus and then you, you poison it. And that works, but it doesn't work nearly as well, particularly in the elderly, as the mRNA. And so, you know, Hong Kong, sadly, Omicron got loose when they only had uh, 35% of elderly vaccinated. And so all of a sudden, Hong Kong, which had been an exemplar uh, because of the failure to get the vaccine out, they had a, one of the highest death rates for the last three or four months. Do you think China can manage this? I mean, they have had a five-week lockdown in Shanghai, largest city in China, the most economically important. They're slowly releasing it, but now there are partial lockdowns in Beijing. And the problem, as you say, is that right now the, the population doesn't have real proper protection because those vaccines are not super effective. They haven't vaccinated a lot of old people. Um, and they seem reluctant to give up on this zero COVID idea, uh, which is tough because Omicron is very transmissible. <coughs> yeah, so their strategy of whenever you see a few cases just go wild at testing and lockdown, you know, in just small parts of the country. So at any one time up until recently, they only had like three or four percent of the country locked down. They could fly in the people who do all that diagnostic work. Omicron is so transmissive that it's possible even they, with all these extreme measures, can't stop it from spreading. They have their pride very engaged in this, and the and the and the public engaged in it because they know that the vaccination levels aren't there. So it's a race to how how much can they keep Omicron from spreading without causing too much human pain or economic damage while they race to get the elderly vaccinated? You know, they need probably eight, nine months to get the vaccination levels up. And, you know, so they every day is a fight. Uh, you know, Beijing uh, will be an interesting front in that war. All right, let me ask some of the questions that have come uh, on the iPad from, right. from the kids. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of people ask, do you think schools are better prepared for the next pandemic? And if not, what should they do? Yeah, the understanding of what distances were safe or what sort of airflow worked and didn't work, uh, we have to do a lot of work and really study that. It's pretty clear that masks did reduce infection, that keeping windows open did reduce infection. Uh, you know, how important was it to keep young people from being infected? Well, you have young people who don't live in multi-generational households. You have young people who do, you know, and, and they have a distinction there. You have teachers, some of whom are uh, quite elderly and at risk and some who are not. So I think it's pretty nuanced. Um, there's no magic thing. Well, online learning <laughs> is magical, but once you get below maybe you know 10th, 9th, 8th grade, the ability that do they have that machine and is it easy for them to stay focused? Is the material there in this engaging way? That gets weaker and weaker. And certainly when you get to K through five, you can't do that much learning just sticking a kid, for a lot of kids, in front of a computer. So. You know, yes, we should get on. I love online learning independent of the pandemic. It's got certain benefits. Uh, so we ought to keep investing in that. That's the only really magical approach. But it's got to get better, don't you think? Oh. I mean, I, I, I've, I love online learning like you. I you do, do a lot of sort of things, you know, on, I, I listen to lectures online a lot. But I'm struck by how much the, the students I've talked to, and I have three kids like you, um, really didn't like it. I mean, you know, they're, um, they feel like, in a sense, it was like you took all the fun out of education, which was, you know, the, the social aspect, the, 
little banter, the seeing people, the showing off in front of your friends, or you know, the trying to impress the girl or the guy, or you know, instead of all that was left was the driest part of the education. And you know, to my mind, I think it shows you that we're we're actually emotional social beings as well as you know, you need a lot of that surround emotionally to take in the information. And stripped of it, people found it very hard to take in that information. No, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, there's a reason why when we tell people, hey, learn physics, we don't just hand them the Feynman textbook right, right. and you say, it's all in there, just yeah. read it. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's a few students uh, like you and I that maybe at least we'd try yeah. to do yeah. it that way, but it's unnatural. Yeah. Uh, it's a social construct, okay, the class is meeting, okay, I have to hand this thing in, uh, even up to college, for a lot of people up to college, although then you get more self-motivation in terms of the, the career uh, that you're pursuing. Some of the online material, I think, can improve the engagement in the information. Uh, and how do you get some of those social aspects in there as well? Um, so it's, it's worth investing in online uh, learning tools for a lot of reasons, and our foundation is one of many uh, who are engaged in that. If you want a personalized material, if you want to help kids catch up, that has a lot of benefits. But we can't, we can't be naive about education is all about motivation. Sarah in New York asks a very important question. Does climate change increase the risks of pandemic? Yes, in that these changing ecosystems have animals seeking new areas to live in because it gets too hot in the areas they're in. And so they, they tend to head away from the equator. Right, right. Uh, and so as they go into those new habitats, they run into farms. Right. Um, you know, there's a famous discussion about Africa that, okay, some of these animals, there's not enough habitat left for them. Well, there's one animal, that, animal that's hogging the habitat. That's the humans, you know. There's too many humans for all those other animals. Uh, and they're and, getting closer and closer. Yeah, right. exactly. And so you end up with, Bushmeat markets, uh, you know, something happened where somebody w was exposed to the blood of a chimpanzee, and that's how the HIV epidemic uh, gets created. In China, they have those wet markets. They may get rid of some of them, but typically the, a lot of people who raise pigs are working in such close proximity. That's where flu, right. flu almost always comes out of uh, China, because that's where the pigs are. Right. Uh, and flu normally is bird, pig, human. Uh, a lot of these other diseases, it's more the animals in Africa. So I notice in your book, you take this as a given. You don't, um, there are people who say, we should try to regulate these wild, uh, wild meat markets. We should try and get them to do them less or in, under more sanitary conditions. Is it that you think this is kind of an unwinnable battle? No, I should have probably put that in. Particularly in China, uh, they, they're they rich enough right. that they can right. massively reduce this risk. I right. mean, in, they, a, in Africa, they don't have enough ref refrigeration, so people are actually buying on a daily basis that stuff. But in, Af in China, they probably could afford it. Yeah, and you know, some of these are such obscure things that even if they ban pangolins being in that market, you know, it's kind of an unappealing uh, thing anyway. Yeah. But I don't think the bushmeat market in Africa, even if you passed a bunch of laws, I don't think they're particularly enforceable. Right. Um, one of the people asks about the uh, mark from uh, New York. What, what, what about mental health? What, are the, uh, what do we know about what the pandemic's effect was on mental health? Well, the numbers are pretty scary. I'm not an expert in that area, but you know, you just look at suicide alone, sort of the ultimate awful uh, number as a measure. You know, you look at, okay, opioid addiction, we were looking like we were getting on the right path, and then it goes back up. So clearly being cooped up, uh, the uncertainty, just less social contact. Uh, and people say the numbers in young people are particularly scary, uh, and yet, you know, where's that new capacity? You know, are there things where you combine human therapy with computer-based therapy that are promising? I sure hope so, but it's, it's not, not an area that uh, I've, I've learned enough about. 
Um, inevitably, I think being uh, school kids, uh, people want to, uh, advice. Um, what should they do to become the richest man in the world? Yeah. Well, don't give money away. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, well, <laughs> for phase one, don't give it away. Phase two. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, I did not think that the work I was doing would make, you know, su such a fortune. I was very lucky that I was exposed to computers. I was a, 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 a I read a lot. I and loved it. It was a very obscure field when you got obsessed. Oh, absolutely. By, you know, people don't realize. Yeah, that. computers were these big, expensive things that only big companies had. And there was this whole thing you would get, like when you got a bill, it might have some computer card in it, and you were supposed to show your resistance to right. the big machine yeah. by like stapling it or tearing it yeah. or things, because <laughs> it represented this big Borg. Uh, type thing. The idea that it's on your desk and you use it and you edit your photos, uh, that was the revolution that uh, my friend Paul Allen and I uh, caught a glimpse of and we had a chance through our work at Microsoft to be part of. You know, we wrote software. There's a lot of miracle things that had to come together. The chip, the disk storage, the optic fiber, and all that stuff just improves at these exponential rates. You know, so now the device in your pocket is a million times better than the personal computer that Paul and I uh, first wrote software for. And so that created, you know, just this very valuable company. Uh, you know, software is, a, uh, if you can stay out in front, uh, it's a, a great field to be in. So, you know, I think the sciences and innovation uh, are a lot of where, in, both improving the world or creating companies uh, that get to a leading position. Um, you know, there'll be some great companies that climate change opportunities will create. Uh, you know, there's all still all sorts of health things uh, that remain unsolved. And, you know, we need some great companies that are, you know, where we're getting rid of Alzheimer's, getting rid of, of obesity. Uh, and, you know, I'd say, you know, you're at an age right now where over the next 20 years, the first part of your career, I do think there'll be breakthroughs in all these, these areas. So how do you, and, and, no, and a couple of people ask this, so, but I'm gonna propose it slightly differently. Um, your own life has been uh, you know, miraculously successful. Obviously you're br brilliant and all that, but there was also an element of luck involved and there's an element of you know, everything, as you said, coming together. And so you've had this just extraordinary career, you know, this, for the history books. And yet when you look at, when you started to look at the world, you started to see all this poverty, all this despair, all this disease in all these places. And now you're seeing things like the Ukraine war and you're seeing climate change and what it could do to the planet. And um, how do you, you know, I know that you're an optimist, but how do you balance these two visions where your own personal life, I mean, it just keeps getting better and better in the sense of, you know, from when you started as a kid, you just got, you know, you, be, you became a billionaire when you were 30 or 31, you became the richest man in the world when you were 35. And yet, you know, these broader conditions around the world seem much more complicated. Yeah, I, I agree that my general optimism can be called into question when you look at, say, political polarization in the U.S. or the uh, bad relationships between U.S. and China that you know seem to get worse, certainly this war in the Ukraine, uh, which I never would have predicted, the amount of suffering uh, and diversion of resources that's going to come out of that will be very dramatic. And so the political side of how we work together, um, which it has, you know, we've always had more democracy and, and less wars. There's a Steven Pinker um, is one of my favorite authors and he has a book called Better Angels of Our Nature. And people have said, no, that's too optimistic to suggest that violence will keep going down. Actually, Pinker doesn't guarantee that. He just documents that it has right. taken place. Um, I also live not in that political realm, but also in that innovation realm. So I get to say, okay, we will eradicate malaria. It'll take us most of the rest of my life, but we will. You know, polio, actually we're pretty close on eradicating that. So I see these wonderful advances, I, and I see society opening up about certain 
you know, social issues like treatment of gay people that, you know, during my lifetime we've gone from pretty bad to not nearly uh, as, as bad on that. But I admit, the big wars, particularly if you get nuclear weapons or bioterrorism, uh, and political polarization, you know, the, the U.S. is more divisive today uh, than at any time in my life. You know, I, I think, still think of those as footnotes, uh, which just proves I'm basically an optimist that I think, okay, maybe some other young person will come along and solve those things because uh, I don't know, you know, how to uh, get rid of the U.S. polarization or get us back into a more peaceful way of looking at these big power relationships. Any final thought for, again, a mostly a young audience? Well, you know, I am upbeat about the opportunity to be, you know, born in the U.S., uh, to be in the U.S. education system. Uh, you can find things that you can really make a big contribution, and you can enjoy doing that. Uh, you know, we need skills. Just take climate change alone. We need so many skill sets, policy, communication, science, you know, you name it, uh, we need it. So, uh, I, you know, I was reading an article about how people are all depressed about climate change. Well, that's not going to help us to just be depressed. So, you know, I, I would leave with the kind of upbeat view that I still believe in innovation for the toughest problems, including uh, solving climate and trying to make sure that uh, there's not a future pandemic. Bill Gates, pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much. It's great. Thank you, guys. Music don't stop for life